Hello, everyone. Uh, years ago, when I used to introduce programs here, I thought I'd either faint or puke. <laughs> they all made me nervous. And, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I haven't been nervous like this in a while because, speaking for myself, white people don't talk about race. Other people talk about race. And I don't have any practice on this. So I am um, glad to be working with Sean. And I, I don't know if I would have been brave enough to have it if you know we weren't friends and we have a um, history here for a while. Is it, it's not an easy thing to talk about. So we'll see what goes on, and I'll be listening. So I'm going to introduce Sean, and she's going to take over the program. And we will do a little bit of sound check because we got five microphones. This one's a little ringy, so I may you know, try to tweak it because I want you to hear and not be annoyed by bad sound. Sean Moliere, Master of Education, is a consultant, community organizer, educator, artist, and co-founder of the African American Alliance, Alliance of the Northeast Kingdom, a grassroots organization committed to racial justice. She initiated and cheered the Women's International League for Peace and Freedoms, Building the Beloved Community Committee, whose mission is to provide educational information about the history and nature of systemic racism, connections between oppressions, internalized oppressions, racial justice, and the struggles for racial justice. As a <clears throat> WILPF delegate, she attended the 2001 United Nations World Conference Against Racism held in Durban, South Africa. She was a core trainer for Theater of the Oppressed Laboratory at the Brecht Forum in New York City. In 2015, she received Linden State College Presidential Medal of Distinction. John has led conflict resolution, human potential, creative expression, racial justice, and community organizing workshops nationally and internationally. Locally, Sean works with Catamount Arts after school and summer camp programs as a teaching artist. And for three years, she was the outreach literacy coordinator here at the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum Children's Library. Currently, she is coordinator of the I Am Vermont 2 photo exhibit, as well as producer and host for a cable access program. I Am Vermont 2 is a medium for people of color to tell their stories and share how microaggressions have a significant impact on their lives. It is a project of the Root Social Justice Center. This is the first known statewide, multi-generational project done only by people of color living and going to school in the state. Sha'an serves on the advisory board of the Root Social Justice Center and the Coalition for Ethnic and Equitable Studies. Originally from New York City, she has lived in the NEK since 1983 and is a grandmother. Sean Boulier. Can you hear me on mic? Okay. Greetings. Thank you for coming this evening. It's an honor for me to be here. Bob introduced me, so I'm not going to tell you my name again. <laughs> um, I do want to thank you for coming and for the Anthony and for hosting the discussion and the panel, and Bob in particular, in helping to install the exhibit. It's a curiosity of living in the kingdom that uh, when we had my going away party, uh, when I left my position here, Scott Davis asked what my plans were. That's, and I had no plans. I literally did not know what I was going to do. So to come back here in this space uh, to present this exhibit is uh, heartwarming. I want to recognize and acknowledge we are occupying the traditional lands of the Abenaki. Chief Don Stevens of the Nohegan tribe says, please respect and protect our land while you are here. This is the land of the Western Abenaki people. Social justice activist Grace Lee Boggs said, creativity is the key to human liberation. Art, 
advocate risk-taking. If I must be an artist, activist, then faith is my muse, trust is my medium, agape, my message, creating my rapture. Soul enslaved in agony, desperate, despondent, despair, voluminous, suffocating clouds extinguishes the light barren solitude, abandoned spirit. Veiled in fear, uncertainty takes hold. Undeterred, desire radiates, fueling the courage to follow the dream. Trust sustained, faith has brought me thus far. Debris of doubt obstruct the way, presenting new paths to ponder. Dare I integrate the debris into my journey, exposing my heart to the experience, penetrating my consciousness, invigorated, I proceed. Eyes on the prize piece about me seeping through my senses, providing visions of possibilities, seizing splendor, yielding to wonder. The dance continues. The pleasure of patience revealed. Trust eliminates worry. Comfort comes with confidence. Strength is born through struggle. Ecstasy envelops me, satisfying my insatiable needs. I have breath, thought, and voice. I have choice. See the light, be the light. Be vulnerable to love. Immerse in its passion. Breathe through its challenges. Bathe in its bounty. Enter its elegance. Woo its wisdom. Rapture, my soul is orgasmic. <laughs> Praising the majesty. Relishing the mystery. Embracing the mosaic. I am impregnated with joy, anxious to deliver, eager to spread the word by Sha'an Moliere. I, um, before we begin, if someone can just pass me those um, definitions. I want to thank my panel, and they will introduce themselves individually and tell you their story. Uh, we have a working definition for this space and time, because we use words as if we all have a foundational understanding. Race is a man-made construct. Racism is a system of advantage based on race. Racist act or behavior supports racism. Racist is someone who has an advantage based on race. Microaggression is a term used for brief and commonplace daily verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities and stresses, intentional or unintentional toward any group particularly culturally marginalized groups. So here are the terms that, and definitions that we're working on. And after the uh, panelists shares their stories, kind of direct you into a discussion. And so whoever would like to begin? I'm the first one in line. Okay, hi, I'm Marjorie St. Marie from Danville, Vermont, and, and I am a Filipino-American Jersey girl. Woo! <laughs> yes, uh, well, also New York City girl, Jersey girl, and um, who married a Vermonter, and that's how I got stuck up here. <laughs> <laughs> 
and um, I'm also a um, mother of three. Two are in school, one is at home. So I'm a part-time um, doctor of chiropractic in Danville as well. And uh, I came to, uh, Filipino-American, so I came as an immigrant from the Philippines when I was 10 years old. And uh, we landed in California and then New York and where we stayed. And I lived there for up until my early high school years and then into New Jersey. And I became a Jersey girl after that. And um, there was racial diversity just everywhere, even in Jamaica, Queens, where I lived. And even though I went to a Catholic school there, there, were, there was one white kid in my class. And um, back in the 80s, we weren't very PC, and we made fun of him, and that, he was okay with that. And we, made fun <laughs> of, we all made fun of each other. And um, so we were all, we, we did it in a friendly and loving way. I, I, I can say that even back then. I, I don't think I can say that now. Um, so th that's my, my beginning. And like I said, I married a Vermonter. And I, other than chiropractic and my children, I love to sing. I sing at church. I don't know if anybody's been to the Catholic church, but once in a while I'll do. Um, I, I'll canter and I play the piano a little bit. And um, I can do weddings and funerals. Let me know. <laughs> Anybody looking for a canter? <laughs> But um, I did become a citizen when I was eight, around when I was 18 years old, and that was, uh, before that it was rough. I guess I was, I, I thought back and I thought, I, I guess I was the original, uh, what do you call them, the kids nowadays, the, who, the dreamers. <laughs> I think I was a dreamer mm. back then, because we, I was waiting. My mom said, don't worry, it'll happen soon, we'll become, um, we'll become citizens. I won't tell you how, but <laughs> it's a different story. And um, I was telling Sean, or my other panelists, that this should be called Invisible in Vermont because I really don't want to be that visible. I think I got tricked into this, Sean. <laughs> um, and um, we, just from experiences, not even Vermont, just elsewhere, you know, I was... I was an 11-year-old, 12-year-old kid who crossed the border over in Niagara Falls with the friends because my mother was at a con uh, convention over there on the American side and said, oh yeah, it's, it's fun back in the 80s. We'll just go across and check out the sites and come right back. It'll, it won't take long. And um, I was the kid that got detained by myself and my, they told my friends to go and that I was gonna be maybe in trouble. And I think I even had my Filipino passport with my visa stamp on it and then I thought, oh my gosh, they're not gonna give me back. <laughs> my mother's gonna, you know, I was 11 years old or 12 and can you imagine what a, a child, you know, so that's a little bit a part of me. So that's why I don't wanna be visible. I wanna be invisible. I wanna just scoot through and just not have to be noticed that much. And um, I can't say I've had strong microaggressions because I was telling George, a fellow panelist there at the end, that you know we've, I don't know if it's being Filipino, we just kind of learn to brush it off and just go on because we're you know made of sturdy things and we just immigrants, we just go along and try to move along. But. Um, Later on, I realized with my son being in school, public school system, and that's where I noticed how things can affect me indirectly. My son had uh, incident, incidents, little incidents that kind of pile up and just made him come home crying, mm -hmm. and that just broke my heart. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't remember this in the 80s when it was just the one white kid and we were all the color, you know, different colors. And um, so, that wasn't my experience, so I couldn't really relate to him. And um, so in terms of other aggressions, I, in Vermont, I love it. I thought, well, everybody's so friendly and nice. They wave to you and honk at you, which, you know, as this, technically I'm a city girl, you know, being honked at at first, I used to duck. <laughs> you just, I, that was my reaction in the city. It's like you get honked at, it's like, oh, what did I do, or, you know, 
just dangerous things would happen <laughs> being honked at. So, um, but yeah, it was a different state, upstate New York, where I saw uh, your driving along friends uh, from ch chiropractic school. They showed, uh, there was this pickup truck in front of us, and they showed a noose in the back of their window. And I thought, and my friends and I thought, wow, did they just carry that around and to show people? It's like, what did they use that for? You know, we were kind of being technical about it, but, but you know, it, it does hurt, and deep down, you're, you're reminded that you are not like everybody else, and um, like them, like they see themselves. So, and, and um, there are funnier sides to microaggressions, like even a family gatherings, you know, we'll, I'll have a family member say, well, oh, he, we have a pineapple, you know how to cut it, right? <laughs> you know? I'll just say, Mm, okay, I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> well, let's figure it out. Um, you just kind of laugh at it, and um, and you try to make it a, a teaching moment, learnable moment, where you can say, well, no, I didn't really. We had maids and <laughs> whatnot, and who did that, and but. Um, so I've lived here in Vermont almost 17 years now, and um, like I said, that's, I didn't think I was impacted by racism or microaggressions. I think Sean is helping me be more aware of that, and, and my son as well, especially my son, and, that's, and um, that makes me want to be mm, not quite visible, but just a little bit more aware, a little bit more active and to help teach people in a loving, understanding way. Mm. Okay. Thank you. My name is Jeff Sawaki. I know some of you, not all of you. Um, I would consider myself to be uh, heterosexual, uh, cis male, which means I was born uh, as a male. Um, and I am, I guess I would say, I'm multi-generational Japanese-American. So that means I was not born here. I mean, no, I was born here. My parents were born here. My grandparents were born here. Um, I have a long history of being born here. <laughs> well, no, I was only born once. Um, and then I'll die once. Um, I. I think uh, I, don't, I don't speak a different language than English, and I never knew one. Mm. My parents neither spoke or learned another language, though I will give you that my grandparents did listen to Japanese when they were growing up and might have spoken it when they were young. Um, but that's about as close as it comes to me. Um, I grew up in a very white neighborhood. Uh, I don't think that's too uncommon for um, some people who are people of color. Um, and so it was very difficult growing up and identifying myself as white because I was surrounded by white people. I didn't even think that I was, like that was something else. But, you know, as you go to school, and I think you touched on this, those little things start to come out that you're different, that you that frankly they don't think that you belong there or that you were dropped here and for some reason you're here. Um, and I think through my little escape in comedy just now, I sort of explained what it's like. So do you speak Chinese? Like do your parents speak Chinese? Are you from China? And then the, the worst is when they go ching chong bing bong and I'm like, whoa. I'm pretty sure that's not Chinese. Also, they speak more than one language. Uh, they write in one language. Um, and, to, and then, you know, the other questions more along. And I think there's a wonderful picture up here that explains it, which is, um, uh, are you from here? No, before that. Well, I was born in California. No, no, before that. Uh, are your parents? Yeah, exactly. So, yes. I, I consider myself very American, um, and, and for a long time, I was self-hating. You know, I didn't want to be Japanese. I didn't want to be the other. Mm -hmm. um, I pushed away everything that belonged to me that was Japanese, with the exception of probably rice. I 
I have to claim that I grew up eating rice because I was allergic to dairy, so I couldn't eat potatoes every day, um, which I learned was something that happened in a lot of households. They ate potatoes. Um, and the first time I was invited over, they were eating potatoes. and. Like, wait, where's the rice? <laughs> but that, that was actually probably more because I was allergic to dairy, more than anything. Um, I am an only child of divorced parents. They divorced amicably, or at least early enough that it didn't become a problem. Um, and so I grew up, spent a lot of my time in Washington State, in California, much more diverse racially. But again, my neighborhood that I specifically grew up in was very white. Um, I moved to Vermont because my wife is from Waterford. Um, and we met in New York. I had gone to grad school in South Royalton, Vermont. I loved it here and you know, really wanted to raise my kids on dirt and trees, and this seemed like a pretty good place. Um, I think my other New York panelists can say there are plenty of trees and parks in New York, and some of them are alive on the side of the road, but um, maybe not the best place to raise your kids around trees. They're more reasons, maybe you have one in your backyard around here. Um, my status, uh, I am opening a brewery. I quit my job. Um, in my previous life, my other hat now that I wore until uh, January or December was community and economic development um, in northern New Hampshire. It's very different in northern New Hampshire, I feel, even from northern Vermont. Uh, my, my experiences in microaggressions are much more significant in northern New Hampshire. And it may, you know, I'm not going to say that it's more ignorant or racist or whatever it is, um, or discomfort, but I had more experience, more time there. Um, and that was actually one question that when I was being interviewed for one of my jobs up there. They said, you understand that people aren't used to seeing people of color. And you will get looks and you'll probably get questions. And some people may not want to work with you. Mm. Um, and I said, that's fine. I mean, one of the things I've taken on as I've sort of overcome my self-hate um, that I deal with, I think many people do, but that I wanted to own who I was and start to take ownership and to show people that I'm just me. And you know, we're all individuals. and. Um, the more you can be around people who aren't like you, the more you can understand we're, we're people. And we're all very interesting and diverse. And we have cool stories to tell, and a life history, and a familial history, um, and friends, and passions. Um, and that's really what I took with me. And you know, I did encounter many sort of terrible things. Um, and if you watch the video of me, you can hear one of them. I won't go into it, but it was similar to the truck with the news, except they were yelling explicitives at me. Mm. Um, probably a community you're very familiar with, but I won't name names. Um, not in Vermont. Um, and that, that really threw me off, because it was a community I wanted to move to, potentially. Mm. It was really cool. I thought it was really happening. Um, and that really threw me ajar. And you know, it just takes one or two or three people your whole, you might have 98% people who really want to welcome you and bring you in. Um, but those few people who set the bar pretty low can put a real damper. And I think that that's what's really important, is that it's, it's uncomfortable being up here and being the star of the spotlight, like I'm, I'm a, I don't know, entertaining, which I'm not hopefully too entertaining. But that, we give you an opportunity to interact with us, know that we're real people, and that it all starts with a relationship. It all starts with getting to know people. And the more we can bring that and know that you know, it's not about finding out about their life history necessarily, but that that's what comes out in conversation. It's not the first question you necessarily ask. It's about learning and getting to know people for who they are as a person, not about where they're from. I mean, what does it matter where I'm from, where my family's from, or something like that? when I first meet you on the street, it's more like, oh, did you get the paper? Did you hear about so-and-so? Or have you been to the newest restaurant or brewery that will open in the spring? <laughs> so that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. I have two kids who are in school right now. They're multiracial, and they haven't been there long enough to experience that, but I'm sure I'll have to 
work on that too later on. Thanks. Mm. Mm-hmm. I say, Helen, like, just keep talking. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right, so my dilemma right now. I need my glasses to see you, but I need to take them off to read. I'm getting old. <laughs> so. All right. So, um. I could go home? <laughs> oh, okay, no, no, okay, no. All right, all right. <clears throat> I'm gonna read this, because I wrote it. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gladys Chambers. I identify myself as a black woman who is a single mother of an amazing 19-year-old young man. My parents are from Jamaica, and I am the last child of four, two boys and two girls. Addiction and trauma were the mainstays of my childhood. Both of my parents passed away very young from alcoholism. I am an alcoholic who is in recovery. I have been sober for almost 20 years, except for a relapse event late 2018 into 2019. I was born and raised in Manhattan, New York. I moved here back in 2002. Growing up in New York City, I was fortunate enough not to have dealt with very much racism. It's common knowledge that New York City is the kind of place where there are many different diverse individuals and cultures who reside together and just live. I moved to Vermont back in 2002 after almost dying in the World Trade Center bombing. Quick story. I had a job interview in Tower One on September 11, 2001. My son vomited on me and made me late for the job interview. And that is how I survived, and I'm here talking to you today. It's a, <laughs> thank you. It's a very long story and very hard events that led up to me moving to Vermont. But the short of it is, I just wanted a place where my son would be safe, a place where he could run on the grass and be a child. I felt like if a landmark vital structure such as the World Trade Center could be blown up, New York City was just not the place to be. Life was going nowhere for me fast in New York City. I had a newborn, newborn son, no high school diploma, and all I wanted to do was drink. So when I was approached by my son's father's landlord about this place called Vermont, sadly, I did no research. I just left my home and I moved here. <laughs> My whole, okay. My whole life, all I've ever wanted to do was help people. I started out at 13 years old working in a daycare, taking care of special needs children. I spent 10 years as a waitress in New York City. Currently, for the past 18 years, I've been an LNA here in Vermont. Back in 2011, I decided to go to college because I wanted to help people beyond being an LNA. Don't get me wrong, being an LNA is important and it's vital, but I wanted to do more. So I started out at CCV, and I got my associates in human services, and then I transferred to NVU and got my bachelor's in psychology. It took me nine years to complete college because I worked full-time as an LNA, and I worked full-time as Nathaniel's mother, and I went to school part-time. During the course of my college career, I had the unfortunate experience of dealing with the community of the Northeast Kingdom. I was required to do different internships and community outreach during my time in college, and I was slapped in the face with nothing but resistance because of the color of my skin when I searched for these internships. I was required to complete three internships for my associates and two internships for my bachelors. All five of my internships came down to the wire because I kept getting turned away by agencies in the Northeast Kingdom because I wasn't a good fit for an internship. One woman even said having me in her office may throw her clientele off when they came looking for services. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I came across some very wonderful people here in Vermont that helped me get through that helped me get through my college career and gave me the in- internships that I needed. But overall the ostracism and trauma I experienced just trying to wade my way through the heartbreaking, implicit racial tension that exists in the Northeast Kingdom was too much for me to cognitively bear. So, after my final internship, which lasted three years, 
and ended with me gaining employment, which was then ripped away from me with no just cause. Yeah, I relapsed. It's so hard for me to say it out loud. I can't believe I'm saying it right now. I had 19 years sober. I'm so ashamed of myself. The racism I experienced in the Northeast Kingdom was very hard for me because it was so slight. I interned and then worked at the brand new recovery center up there, and I became the backbone of that place. I don't care what anyone says. I did everything up there, but I wasn't even allowed to take a lunch break. I kept the doors open to the recovery center using every resource I had in my brain with little to no help from anyone, not the executive director or anyone else that was involved. I wasn't even allowed to participate in community meetings. I was taunted at the recovery center, called things like Aunt Jemima, Crispy, Sealy from the Color Purple. I also wondered, I, I always wondered, why do I stay here? Why am I dealing with this abuse? But it was important to me that that recovery center succeeded. It was important for me to have a safe haven for individuals who were looking to recover from any kind of addiction. I tried to develop a culture of understanding, compassion, empathy, and trust in the town of Newport, and in the end, I was banned from the recovery center. In the end, the reason I was given was totally bogus for being fired. I was told in my only evaluation after three years in that recovery center that I was not a leader. I had no business trying to help people recover from addiction, and that I was doing more harm than good in the town of Newport. I'm coming out of the dark now, trying my best to move me and my son Nathaniel forward. It's been hell here in Vermont for me and him because of the color of our skin. We've isolated ourselves currently at, we've isolated ourselves, and currently at the age of 19, my son is morbidly obese. And I am afraid to allow him to even learn to drive. I don't want him behind the wheel. A black man in the state of Vermont, I don't see that ending well for him. I always get asked, by my family, why do we stay here? How could you keep your son here? After all we've been through, I say, why the hell not stay here? Why can't we be here? What is the reason for making life so hard? Honestly, I never heard of the term microaggression until I met Sean. Mm. <laughs> I always thought the sly little comments that white folks would make were just part of, the, of conversing. It's so crazy to think about it. These comments that would make us so uncomfortable, comments like, what do you use to comb your hair? Or you speak so well, seem like compliments, but they were really jabs. I get it now. Mm -hmm. When I think about all that my son went through in the school system of Vermont, it just makes my skin crawl. I feel like an unfit mother for keeping him here and making him go through what he went through. But again, I didn't realize, I didn't know. It was during the course of my college career that I learned about internalized racial oppression. There's actually a scale for that. <laughs> They measure it. <laughs> it just seems to me that after centuries of boring it into our heads that we're not good enough and putting labels on us that we're not good enough, calling us the minority, we're not good enough, you start to believe, you start to believe it, you start to live it, you start to become it. At least this is how I feel in my, my life has gone because of all the trauma, because of pushing me down and making me feel like I'm not good enough, because of the color of my skin and my gender. I believed it, I lived it, and I didn't see anything wrong with it until shut down. And she told me, girl, there's everything wrong with it. Mm. Currently, I feel like for my mental safety and for, the life, and for life to move forward for my son, we're going to have to leave Vermont. Believe me, I don't want to think, I don't want to think Vermont is a place that would be so harmful. It's wonderful, it's a wonderful state to look at, but if there can't be some common ground found, then I don't know what to do. I don't want to be an LNA anymore, but I am so afraid of trying to use my degree in the community. I never want to give up myself, as I did in Newport, just to be banned ever again. My son and I deserve a life of safety. We deserve a life where our contributions will be acknowledged and valued. We deserve a life that has no possibility of being hindered because of foolish, implicit attitudes. Living in Vermont has caused my son and me to develop these armors around us. We don't go anywhere because of fear that we will be targeted, be it in a restaurant or in a supermarket. I have been thrown out of establishments in Vermont because of the color of my skin. And it was labeled 
They just didn't want to have to worry about me anymore. I had my car taken away from me by Border Patrol because I couldn't give them any decent drug information. So I was searched by four officers and my car was impounded back in 2010. We don't trust anyone up here because we never know who's going to have an issue with the color of our skin. What can the community do as a whole to make things better? Just stop it. We've done nothing to warrant the implicit nasty attitudes that we get. Recognize the fact that we are people and we have a lot to offer. Collaborate with us and stop trying to take our efforts and pass them off as your own. There's been enough of that. In Newport, I was used and abused and discarded. And it's time to put an end to all of this. It's time to recognize that we are all people. It's time to change our attitudes so our children have better lives. Our children deserve the chance to grow up in a world where we are all people. We are all given the same opportunities to make life doable for everyone around us, not just people who are not of color. I'm sick of it, and the state of Vermont should be ashamed of itself. Thank you. Mm. Let's all take a deep breath in. Yes, can we? Take a breath, a deep breath, expanding your stomach. Hold it and let it out, contracting your stomach. And again, inhaling through your nostrils, keeping your shoulders steady, expanding your stomach, holding it. Exhaling through your mouth. And one more inhale. And exhale. Okay, hello. This is the first time I'm meeting Gladys. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> it's your story, it's not dramatic. My name is Sahra Ali. Um, I know some of you. Um, I ironically came to Vermont for community. Um, I'm just only saying ironically as I sit here on this panel. Um, I am from Somalia. Um, I was born in a little small village in uh, the northern Sanag region. Um, I came to the States when I was eight years old. I grew up in Jersey City, so I too was a Jersey girl. Um, and we left New York, uh, where my dad worked at Penn Station for over 10 years, um, after 9-11. Um, things were just really difficult, it was hard to be Muslim. Um, so we moved to Columbus, Ohio, and that is where I spent um, high school and college, and I've kind of been vagabonding ever since. Um, so those of you who came to the um, Telling Project, uh, same moon, my cast member, Derek, is here. Hi, Derek. <laughs> um, so you might know my full story from there, um, which is great, because I don't have to go into it. Um, so yeah, so we put on this uh, documentary play um, with KCP Presents producing it. Um, and it told the stories of eight uh, Vermonters, um, new Vermonters. Um, some, like Derek, have been here for a million years. Um, and I am, I guess I am, I guess I still consider myself very new. Um, I haven't even wrapped up a full year. Um, Vermont's kind of like that lover I keep coming back to. 
so I've decided to kind of give it a go. Um, uh, it be, well, it's land. It's better to come back to land than a person. Um, but, uh, yeah, so um, just a little bit about the Telling Project. Um, we had eight amazing people. Um, I was fortunate enough to co-direct it along with Ariel Zivon. Um, and we had um, a woman from Sudan, um, a man from Ghana, um, Madagascar, uh, Jamaica, um, Nepal. Um, gosh, I don't want to miss it all. Who else? There, come on, help me out. Uganda. Uganda. No, Congo. Congo. Timba. <laughs> we can't forget Timba. Um, I, I think that's most of them. And then we had an amazing uh, singer-songwriter um, that's Puerto Rican coming from, uh, she lives in Essex, and she told the story of a migrant dairy uh, worker um, from Vermont um, who's no longer uh, with us because she was deported. So that was, it was, it was a really moving experience. Um, <clears throat> Um, I was really happy to be a part of it. I think that was the first time that I actually um, shared myself uh, fully like that. Um, I am a freelance writer. Um, let's see, I do diversity work as well. I write for the North Star, um, Hardwick Gazette, just because I really love telling local stories. Um, it beats copywriting. I was telling, um, who was I telling? Was I telling you? Yeah, I used to do copywriting, which is really boring, um, but paid the bills. Um, so I really, so going back to why I came to Vermont, initially I took a job with uh, Karma Cholin, which most of you should know, um, and in Barnet, and it was a, uh, I did about four months there, uh, living and working there. Um, and I really fell in love with the landscape, and I've always kind of been into the mountains. Um, and then I left for a few months, traveled for like a year and a half, found my way back somehow. Um, I work over at Moose River, uh, Lake and Lodge store. Um, so I see people all the time come in. Um, it's kind of hard not to be seen when I'm working in such a visible store. Um, Let's see, what else? I didn't, I, I didn't come prepared at all. I thought I could actually wing it. Um, let's see, what is it like for your family living here? Well, you don't have to answer. No, I know, that was a joke. Um, let's see. Hmm. Um, for the most part, I'd say Vermont has been pretty um, good to me. Um, I have found a community here. I think community looks different um, depending on where you are in your life and what you're looking for. Um, I am a young woman in my 30s. Um, I'm not looking to be partnered, so that works out really well for me in the Northeast Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm left alone for the most part. Um, uh, let's see, as far as uh, microaggressions, um, you know, I can't say that I have not been um, a victim of it. Um, I, I think, you know, in my in, in my picture I put um, on, on mine, uh, I put I'm not your African story, and that has a lot to do with um, the continent of Africa is so elusive, and even with everything that is known about it, um, every time I tell someone where I'm from in Somalia, I kind of get this feedback of you know, projection of someone else's African story. You know, I, I have a son who did Peace Corps, you know, in Zambia. I, you know, lived in Madagascar once. And um, that's, you know, that, that's, that's kind of, you know, it's a little off-putting. Um, I never know what to say to that. Um, I think, you know, I'm generally a very happy person. Um, and I really, really, one thing I really want this, like, one takeaway from this, um, being here tonight with all these incredible people um, with different stories uh, beside me, is that joy is really, really important in life. Um, and I, I like to seek joy. And I know everyone else does as well. Um, and 
it's really difficult to uh, maintain a level of joy or seek joy uh, when, you, when you feel like you're being othered. And you know, when you're being othered, your joy is also othered. Um, so just like even really tapping into that part of you that wants to be um, safe and, and uh, happy or just okay or neutral um, can be really hard to access. Um, so I'd say if we can just be mindful of, of that before we even talk about microaggressions and what that looks like, if we can just be mindful um, of, of the fact that most people, everyone, is, um, especially in this really, really tumultuous time that we're living in, trying to seek some sort of joy. Um, and whatever that looks like, sometimes that joy could look like, you know, just having a uh, roof over your head. Sometimes it could look like, you know, um, pursuing a dream uh, in a really difficult place. Um, but yeah, if we can just remember that and humanize one another. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Can you guys hear me? No? This one's better. Good evening, everyone. My name is um, my name is George Sales Rosales. Um, it's it's good to see familiar faces, and it's great to see um, new faces as well. Um, I am Filipino American. I moved here when I was 17, and um, I am married to a wonderful man from Barry. We've been together for almost 15, 16 years now, and that's sort of leads leads me to the, my next story is why am I here? It's because of because of Pat. Um, so when I first met, met Pat, it was one of those, you know, like surreal moments, like, wow, Vermont, wow, there's actually somebody from Vermont here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> uh, yeah, because I grew outside of Washington, D.C. I moved there when I was 17. So every other year, we would come and visit Vermont, and then my in-laws, who were Pat's parents, would come and visit us in Washington. And then one, you know, one year we just decided, you know, why don't we just move up to Vermont? You know, just quit this rat race and keeping up with the Joneses and, and stuff, and you know, like one-hour traffic just to get five miles from here. <laughs> um, and Pat's reaction was like, why would you want to move up there? There's a lot of roughnecks, and you know, so I'm like, I thought it was beautiful. So really, the way we react to the world is how we um, perceive it. But more importantly, is, is how we re react to you know, incidents that happen to our lives. So I, I do share some of, um, some of the experiences that other panelists have had. Um, the way I view it is that I, you know, I, I try to rise above it. I try not to let it bother me. Um, even though I know it should, but I you know, keep reminding myself, you know what, you're, you're better than this, right? So, um, we actually have a script, so I'll try to follow it a little bit. <laughs> you're gonna get in trouble, she's right beside me. Um, so, we moved up here in 2013. Um, my mother and my father uh, joined us, and when we moved up here, Pat's parents were still in Barry, and that was still quite a schlep, especially if they, you know, if they had an accident, we still have to go 15 minutes from here. So we moved them over to where we live, so they're much closer now. Um, it's, it's been very interesting, you know, the, the hardy Vermonters are, are really hardy, and I'm, I'm stereotyping, of course. Um, they they love the cold weather. They they you know they they just plug and chug and move along. <laughs> so, I grew up in the tropics. <laughs> doesn't go doesn't go below seventy five degrees. <laughs> um, so f for me, moving up here was was interesting. Um, Having moved to Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia to be more specific, I've already been involved in a lot of, I've been exposed to many cultures, many languages, many you know, different things, right? And 
even from my background, and perhaps your background as well, the Philippines used to be under Spain for so many years and then was under the U.S. for so many years. So we're really exposed to different cultures to begin with. So the way I would, um, I would perceive things, I may not, it may not be the same as the next person. So just like Sakra, um, or um, was it Gladys who mentioned about microaggression, I wasn't really too familiar with it until um, Sean introduced me to it. <laughs> I'm like, hey, you're right, you know? <laughs> because all throughout my life when we moved here, we've already faced challenges. And we've always, you know, I've always figured, well, I have to do better. You know, I have to, I have to, you know, I, I can't let it bother me. So if somebody's, you know, yeah, you gotta move on, right? So um, I put myself through school. I went to undergraduate in a school in Virginia, and I also put myself through through grad school as well. So when every time I um, I hear kids nowadays complain about you know education, blah blah blah. Well, Tell you what, when we came to this country, we only had our suitcases and the shirts on our backs. But I, you know, if you work really hard, you can, you, can, you know, you can achieve what uh, what you set out to do. Um, what are my passions and, and interests? So, some of you may or may not know, I, I opened a restaurant downtown. It's called Pika Pika Filipino Cuisine. Little plug. <laughs> um, for, for the longest time, I was in project management. I, I worked in DC, I, I worked in big projects left and right, either private or public sectors. When we moved up here, I figured, okay, Pat's able to work remotely, which is great, and for some reason, I couldn't find a job. <laughs> so um, I ended up traveling quite a bit, flying in and out to where projects were. And then one, one year, I just decided, you know what? Screw it. What's the point of moving to Vermont if I can't live here? And that's when I decided to just start my business. I love to cook. I love to eat. I love to entertain people. Um, so that's how it started. Um, so I'm just going to touch on briefly on microaggression, just because um, I, I know we've we've already spent a lot of um, um, you know time in. At least in my experience, it's it's really early on in, in my career when I would see, you know, people who would make certain assumptions right away if you walk into a room. Um, of course, when when I was still starting out early on in my career, you know, people just assume that just because you're you, know, you look different, you're um, you know, this is your role, this is your task. Um, and even when, when I worked on projects here in, in Vermont and Montpelier, I, I would walk into meetings and you know, I'm like, oh wow, I just pretty much doubled the number of minorities in the room. <laughs> um, so people have certain expectations, which I thought was, you know, like, okay. Um, but like I said earlier, I, 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 you know, I try to rise up and I, I show them that, you know, this is really what I can do. I'm not here just to take notes, or I'm not just here to do this or that. Um, I'm actually really here to contribute, be part of the, uh, be part of the team. So basically, it's it's really finding your your place at the table. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, ever since I, I got involved in this project, I, I realized that yeah, it is you know it is um, prevalent. It may not be as as um, as obvious. But I, I think that with more awareness, not just from from this panel or, or you know, people who are marginalized, but I think also for those from from the the majority group, just to realizing that you know we all have different experiences, different backgrounds. Um, but what's more important is how we how we react to certain incidents and, you know, moving forward. So I thank you. So I want to thank my panelists, Marge and Jeff, Gladys, Sarah, 
and George. I don't know if you realize how vulnerable and what a gift they've given you. We don't often have an opportunity to tell our stories. Other people tell our stories. And as you can see from the group, we're buried. And I, at one point in my life, had to learn about microaggressions. When I came up here from New York City, I, again, you have blinders, you accept some things and you move forward. It was through my son's experience in schools that made me realize, oh, there's something else going on and set me down this wonderful rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. It's almost time to end and I really want to respect everyone on this evening. When we said we'd have a panel discussion originally, we didn't, we were gonna look at four, we had five. We have a, and I asked for it, we have such a rich and varied group. Many times we're think, thought of as monolithic. So to be able to um, bring to forth who we are, how we contribute to the community. And for many of us, we just want to get from one day to the other. We want to develop relationships based on things we have in common, on love. And Gladys is talking about leaving last year five people that I knew left Vermont. And they left Vermont because they either couldn't raise their children here, they didn't feel safe. When we think about communities, thinking about what does it take for the others to be here? When you're making up that table, when you're inviting others, how about asking us what would make us feel welcome? Is there any question that you might want to ask the panel in regards to their story? If there's something that might have sparked you from their story that you might want to know a little bit more about. We have maybe three minutes. Uh, <laughs> if not, <laughs> uh, we can, again, I want to thank you for your, um, not only your contribution to the community, but to me. So when I started, not too long ago, I realized I didn't know many men of color in this community. I knew Derek. <laughs> <laughs> and it was an awkward position to be in. And so the journey of getting to know <laughs> George and to getting to know Jeff, the other uh, folks were friends. So I'm in this process just as you are. Uh, Derek was telling me about Arian, and I was feeling a little uncomfortable to walk into a restaurant and just to say, uh, can I take your picture and be part of a collection? <laughs> I did. You have no idea. It's like I put on this whiteness, because that's the other side of people just wanting something. And I walked in, and I stopped dead in my tracks, because I've known Arian since he was four years old. <laughs> So I've been around, and his mom is here, Judy. Did she leave? Hi. So Judy was one of the, and I just want to point out, Judy was one of the parents and on the council when we had the African American Alliance way back when. 
and she was one of the people that we contacted when we were going to demonstrate at the Brighton School, which we didn't have to because they stopped the slave auction and the depiction of the slave trade. So uh, it's wonderful to be, yes? Um, I heard a number of you mention the children having problems in schools. And what, what can we do to... So I'm going to go back so again. So that doesn't happen to, to children. I just think that's a horrible. So I thank you for your question. We're not here to answer that question. Oh. Oh. <laughs> when I ask, and, and I want you, and, and this is typical. I've been doing this around the state. And what happens is white folks in the audience want us to solve a dilemma, an issue that is multi-layered. I have been working in schools for over 30 years advocating for kids. The, the progress we've made now is the Vermont Coalition for Ethnic and Social Equi <coughs> Equitable Studies in Schools. But that to, to think that as a panel and we're sharing our stories, if you would like that, we would love to charge you a consultation fee. <laughs> I'm serious. I am serious. So in asking, I respect your asking that question, but that's not what we're up, that's not what we're here for. And just that question requires consultation or training. I'm doing a, uh, racial literacy training that's starting in Crassberry and in Newport dates to follow. We're still dealing with that and working with Julie Henson at the uh, School Promoting Racial Justice in School. Is there any last word? Yeah, I, I think it touches actually on what was just brought up. Um, when I was at my last job, um, they, they went through this whole diversity and inclusion issues and I was the one person of color um, that that was visible and I'm vocal and I'm not afraid to say what I say, um, but that I was tokenized. Um, and it, you know, it, it wasn't done intentionally, it was done because of not knowing that we all share, share different experiences and that just because I'm a person of color doesn't mean I have the answers. Um, I just know my experience, and I encourage them, I won't name the institution, but I encourage them, you need to hire a professional. You need to hire someone who went through the training, who, who knows the book back and forth. Um, and it took a year pounding that, of being tokenized, of being asked, did I do the right thing? Am I doing the right thing? I'm like, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. And I appreciate you reaching out. But it's really about digging in deep, hiring professionals who can walk you through it. It's multi-layered. Just having one solution may not, is certainly not gonna fix a lifetime <coughs> history of, of challenges. And um, they're on the right path now. Um, but I, I would encourage you all to not, and this is probably the biggest sort of nitpicky thing that I always get is, when you're called out, oh, what do you think about this? And because you're a person of color, mm -hmm. um, it's probably one of, can, while done honestly, can be the most hurtful because it's assuming you are the answer or that you know the solution mm -hmm. because of what you look like. Or it's your problem. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. I think that that's, I think that's one thing that I've learned that I didn't really get that experience until it was put on my lap. Mark, did you have any last words? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Just, just to piggyback off of what Jeff just said. Um, so, <laughs> I think it's also very important that white people talk to each other <laughs> about these things as well. Um, uh, I have a blended family, um, and one of the most important things is uh, 
just the questions that you have that are burning and the change that you want to see or the confusion, um, like talking about it with your partner, with your friends, with you know, um, your community, um, so, so it doesn't have to get to this, if that makes sense. Just, just have the conversations. They're very difficult. I know I have a lot of friends, a lot of white friends who can't even talk to their parents because you know they support a you know a different uh, policy or politics. You know, um, so yeah, um, and and maybe instead of you know the question being well, um, you know, well well intentioned, just just it, it, it's almost like. Um, I liken it to like a muscle in our body um, that we have that we uh, don't know about and we've never really worked it out. Um, so you may see another person or a group of people who exercises that muscle well, um, but we have it too, we, everyone has it. So these conversations, like they need to continue happening and they need to be inside homes and um, in organizations. I can't tell you how many organizations um, the St. Saint, Saint Johnsbury Academy doesn't have a diversity person. Like, that's, that's insane to me. Um, so, yeah. That's funny, when uh, that question was answered about what can we do, and I, I'm thinking, oh yes, the, all these answers of, and that would be me asking, wanting things to be done as a mother, and um, it's, Thank you for bringing that up, that we do need people to help. Um, they need to be trained professionals. That would be a great thing. And um, because I, I don't know what to do. I, I, I really came across this a week, two weeks ago. And of course, as a mother, any mother you know, who comes across any adversity that your child has, you think, OK, you talk to the principal, guidance counselor, whatnot. But yes, we need help, and I don't, we don't have the answers. And because there's a part of us that, some of us just, that just want to go along and just take it because we're used to it. Mm -hmm. Because we didn't want to be visible and we just wanted to get through. And there's a part of me that just wants to tell my son, why, why can't you just take it? Mm -hmm. Because that's what I would have done growing up. That's how I felt like I got, you know, got away through the border, or whatnot, um, over in Canada. And um, but you know, that's not an answer. That's not. I had to take that back and say, no, I can't tell him that. There's got to be a better way. And just since learning about this microaggression, blah, blah, blah. you know, I really have to say I do love Vermont. I have thanked my husband many times and said, you know, thank me, thank you for taking me out of New Jersey <laughs> and having me get rid of all my high heels and <laughs> living in snow boots and whatever because look, what we, we went to Burke Mountain, we went snowboarding with our son and go hiking and all this and that and people for the most part, the friendly ones, are really friendly. You know, it's like I, I focus on that and I try not to think of the other parts so I'm, I'm actually trying to uh, really be respectful of time. Um, and Gladys, do you have a couple of words that you wanted to say? And I, I just before, part of white supremacy culture characteristics is either or. Please understand, we can love Vermont as we are challenged by Vermont. Mm -hmm. We can love, we are here. And so there doesn't necessarily need to be an apology to say that the fact that we're here says something and allow that to, to stand on its own. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not an apology. Let's just move forward. Okay. People with Thank you so much, John. It doesn't need to be as hard as it has been. Mm. Let folks just live. Mm. And Jordan, did you want to? Yeah, I, I think the, the best way to just break down, you know, barriers is just have a conversation. Mm. Yeah. You know, 
Start with hi. Hello. At Pika Pika. At Pika Pika. <laughs> I, l I love um, explaining the, the culture of the Philippines. And like I said, we are a product of our, our histories. So whatever we are today is, is a product of you know, our experiences, whether it be good or bad. So yeah, thank you for inviting us.